Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us for class two of One Healthy World. Um, thank you for joining us from, from all over the world. I can see um, hundreds of people commenting already. Uh, we've got people from uh, New York, from Germany, Oregon, uh, all over Canada, Vancouver, um, Wales, uh, Michigan, uh, Greece. So wherever, you, wherever you're joining us from, thank you so much again for, for coming back. I hope you've had a very healthy and happy week. Uh, I'm Dr. Josh Cullimore, the Director of Preventative Medicine at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And I'm joined again today by uh, Dr. Neil uh, Barnard. Hello, Dr. Barnard. Hello, Dr. Cullimore. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So um, if I remember, you gave everybody a, a task last week, Dr. Barnard. Can you remind us what that was? Well, last week, our job was to think about what the foods would be if we were actually going to eat an entirely plant-based diet. The idea wasn't necessarily to go vegan last week, but the idea was to think about what you would be eating for breakfast and lunch and dinner if you were. So I'm hoping people have got some ideas. I hope they'll be sharing them in the chat today. Yeah, thank you. So um, how many of you were able to, to do that? And do tell us in the chat. And uh, if you were, how did you find it? Uh, if you missed last week's class, don't worry at all. Uh, Dr. Barnard will give us a, a brief summary and you're very welcome to watch the first class on the resource website um, at a time that's convenient for you. And today's class will also be available from tomorrow on the website. So please do let any friends or relatives know um, who, who want to get healthy in the new year. Uh, One Healthy World is a brand new program um, to support anyone wanting to transform their health um, by changing their diet. Uh, as a reminder, we have registered dietitian Susan Levin answering your questions. So if you've got any nutrition specific questions, please do put them in the Q&A box. Um, and for any general comments, um, please put them in the chat box and Rosendo Flores uh, can answer any general or, or admin questions. Um, so in today's program, we're going to start with Dr. Barnard, who will explain, explain why and how we should change our diets. Dr. Shireen Kassam will be rejoining us to discuss heart health. Uh, dietitian Karen Smith will explain how to replace the meat, dairy and eggs in your diet. And then we will have our expert panel discussion with Chef Kola, Willie Jonas, Luke Tan and Rahini Bajakal uh, to discuss more meal planning ideas and, and recipes from around the world. So uh, to kick things off, I have the great pleasure to hand over again to Dr. Neil Barnard, the President of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Adjunct Professor of Medicine, author, editor and TV host. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. Thank you, Dr. Colmore. Okay, let me share my screen. Last week, we talked about some of the reasons why a person might want to adopt a plant-based diet, might want to make some changes. So I'm hoping you can see that. Um, as you know, I want to thank you all because One Healthy World is not just in English. It's also in Spanish, it's in French, we have one in Mandarin, and we have a special English language program for our friends in India. So we're part of a really big thing. So thank you for joining us. And thank you for spreading the word to your friends and family about it. Okay, um, I want to revisit some things, but kind of go in a little bit new direction with some information that we didn't present last week. But if you get a chance to see last week's program, if you haven't seen it yet, please do, because I'm not going to repeat everything. And there's some cool stuff we talked about last week. Okay, the big reason why everybody wants to change their diet in January, you know it, they want to lose weight. And we learned a lot about losing weight in a weight control study that we did. We brought in 64 women. They all wanted to lose weight. And they had all done, they had done every kind of diet known to humanity and weren't getting very far. So we decided to test a conventional diet versus a completely plant-based diet, vegan diet, keeping oils low. And there was no exercise in the program. It was a 14-week study. So what we asked people to do was to eat fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes, meaning 
beans and lentils. Um, and the foods that you can turn these ingredients into are pretty normal foods like pancakes without the butter or a chili, not a meat chili, a bean chili, or your linguine arrives, not drowning in butter, but drowning in wonderful tomato sauce or artichoke hearts or seared oyster mushrooms or you name it. During this study, the only rules were no animal products, keep oils low, and some of our participants surprised us by telling us that Twizzlers are vegan. You know what I'm talking about. Well, not exactly the healthiest choice, but they weren't actually, they were not actually excluded. It was just vegan low oil. So our low-fat vegan Twizzler fueled research participants set off on their path to the unknown and they lost weight. The vegan group lost about 13 pounds. The, the comparison group lost about eight pounds. But what was more important, what happened as time went on from there? We continued to follow the participants in the conventional group and they put back the weight they lost. But the people in the vegan group didn't. They were skinnier at two years than they were at the beginning. In other words, you're making a qualitative shift. There's no reason for the weight to come back. And then Geico, the car insurance company said, let's do a study together. So we did. What was the study? Once a week, everyone got together who wanted to lose weight or improve diabetes. And we got together in the Geico conference room and we taught them how to go vegan, which they did. And the cafeteria manager said, I will provide vegan foods for you. Now, there were a few missteps along the way. Anybody spot the problem with this? Well, eventually the manager realized that you don't put bacon and cheese on your vegan burger. But people in the control group didn't lose any weight. People in the vegan group lost weight beautifully, and it proved that the diet works. And for some of our participants, this was a life-changing experience after struggling to lose weight getting it off, keeping it off, feeling empowered, having lower cholesterol and a better life in so many ways. It was just a transforming experience and I hope it will be for you too. Okay, the foods are delicious, cholesterol free. But there's a couple of other surprises. First of all, let me just walk you through a couple of things here. You compare say red meat and people will think, all right, I should have less red meat because it's got cholesterol and saturated fat. I should eat more chicken which happens to have cholesterol and saturated fat, or, or I should have more fish. And that's got cholesterol and saturated fat in it too. Hmm. They vary a little bit, but look at plants. Look at those numbers there. What do you see? What's the cholesterol number? Anybody? Zero, zero. Plants don't have cholesterol at all. And look at the saturated fat, almost zero too. Day and night difference. And that's why Dr. Dean Ornish used plant-based diets for people with heart disease. And when you see what happens, see the artery on the left, see the artery on the right, what's the difference? The difference is it's the same person's artery. That diseased looking artery was before this patient went on a completely low fat vegan diet. No statins, no nothing, just the diet change and healthy lifestyle. The arteries can open up again. Okay, but there are more surprises. Uh, Although arteries, blockages can form in the heart, that's actually not the first place that they form. Your aorta goes all the way from your heart down to your legs and at every vertebral segment, little tiny arteries branch off from the aorta to nourish your vertebrae and to provide oxygen to the discs between the vertebrae. And it turns out that the very first place where atherosclerotic plaques form that's right, the things that come from bacon grease and cheese and eating turkey and fish and things that have cholesterol in them and animal fat in them. The first places that the artery blockages form happen to be in the lumbar aorta, the aorta in the lower back. And by about age 20, a lot of people have already got narrowed arteries going to the spine in the lower back. So what does that mean? What if I don't have such good circulation to my lower back anymore because of atherosclerosis? Here's what it means. By the way, if the, if the photo strip is getting in the way of these pictures, just drag the photo strip out of the way. If you don't have good blood supply to your back, between the vertebrae, the discs, which are little shock absorbing cushions, start to degenerate and they can break. And the stuffings come out of the, of the disc and they push on a nerve and that causes pain all the way down where that nerve goes. That can be down your leg, it can be your lower back. Wait a minute, am I saying, 
that back pain starts from breakfast? It's exactly what I'm saying. We eat foods that cause artery blockages. The first place it happens is in the lower back. You're starving your healthy spine for oxygen and it starts to degenerate. Here's the good news. The problems are there, but they can be reversed. Yep, Dean Arnold showed the arteries open up again. Uh, weight that's gained has been lost. Diabetes that comes in can get better too. And we've seen the proof of this with all kinds of things. And one of the biggest surprises, perhaps for a lot of men who come into our studies, is after three, four months on a vegan diet to, to get their weight down or to get their diabetes under control, is they discover that their erectile dysfunction has gone away. They're feeling better. Again, they're feeling energetic in so many ways. We've seen migraines improve, menstrual pain improve, uh, hot flashes getting better and going away. All these changes are there, and we're going to talk about all of them in the weeks to come. So what do we need to do? Well, our assignment now is we've hopefully made our list. If you haven't made your list yet, you've still got time, and you can do that. Make your list of vegan foods that you'll eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. When you're ready, when you've got your list, jump in. You're at the edge of the swimming pool, you've been sticking your toe in the water and it looks like it's good, but we gotta jump in and find out. So that means step two is after we've got a good list, jump in and let's do it 100% vegan all the time and see how you feel. Don't do it part of the time because you really wanna see what that diet will do for you. Will it actually cure your digestive problems, make your migraines go away, get your weight down, give it a shot. And the way to do that is to do it all vegan all the time. But because that sounds daunting, We'll do it for just three weeks or so as a test, no long-term commitment, but I think it'll change your life. Okay, back to you, Josh. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnard. You'll be pleased to hear um, lots of comments uh, from people that have, have made their list and some people are already ahead with their homework and have tried some delicious recipes, got some great recipes for uh, lentil shepherd's pie and someone's tried uh, some recipes from our website, the um, smoked almond cheese balls sound delicious. I'm going to try those myself. Um, someone's tried to, someone's been vegan since Saturday and has found it much easier than they were expecting. So um, that's that's what we hear a lot. So that's that's great. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Barna. We'll come back to you again uh, shortly. But I'm now going to hand over to uh, our guest uh, who is kindly joining us again from uh, last week, Dr. Uh, Shireen Kassam. She is a consultant haematologist from London and the founder and director of uh, plant-based health professions, professionals UK. Uh, Dr. Kassam is going to tell us how changing our diet uh, benefits our heart. Thanks, Dr. Kassam. Thanks, um, Josh, and it's wonderful to be um, back again. Um, so I talked about uh, maintaining a healthy weight last week, and I'm back talking about heart health today. Um, so I thought I'd stick with the theme. Um, you met two members of my family last week, my husband and my dog Pansy, um, but today you meet my father. Um, back in September 2020, 2020, um, he was overweight, had high triglycerides and was found to be pre-diabetic. So he met the criteria for metabolic syndrome. He had quite, has quite an extensive past medical history of ischemic heart disease, all the risk factors that you might imagine for that high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And unfortunately, he'd had to have a Whipple's operation for pancreatic cancer back in 2004. And so he's done extremely well. Um, but we had been forewarned that um, diabetes may be a complication of that as a third of the pancreas is removed at that operation. So we'll come back to him in a, in a moment. So just to focus in on heart disease, nine risk factors account for 90% of cases of heart disease, and they are listed here. Um, and those highlighted in bold are directly related to our diet choices. And the critical driver event that causes the buildup of plaque in our heart arteries is when LDL, which becomes oxidized, enters the thin one cell layer, the endothelium lining the inner heart arteries, um, penetrates it and creates this inflammatory reaction which brings together lipids and cells and inflammatory cells and forms this plaque that eventually um, can um, erode 
through and rupture or just block off the artery. So what do we want out of our diet then if five out of these nine risk factors are related to our diet choice? Well, we want our diet to be low in energy density, high in fiber, which means it will help us maintain a healthy weight. Um, it'll keep our gut bacteria happy and our lipid levels um, in control. We want it to be low in saturated fat. And this is really important because as I say, the key driver is LDL cholesterol. And you can see that there's a linear relationship between eating saturated fat, predominantly from animal foods, and the LDL cholesterol in your blood. Um, in contrast, if you eat fat, fats found in healthy plant foods, the mono and polyunsaturated, that LDL cholesterol is driven down. We want our diet to be full of um, antioxidants and anti-inflammatory um, compounds, which are found in healthy plant foods. We want to avoid harmful factors that are found in um, red meat, for example, the saturated fat, the heme iron, um, the advanced glycation end products, um, nit nit nitrates and nitrites that get converted into unhealthy um, compounds in our gut. And of course, as we say, the health of our gut microbiome is key to all the functionings in our body and fiber feeds these gut bacteria. So what does this protective diet look like? Well, you've seen it all before. It's this power plate from the PCRM, which I've slightly adapted. I've added on some crucial um, vitamins, the B12 and vitamin D, a small portion of nuts and seeds um, is excellent for heart health, um, adding herbs and spices full of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds, and of course, full of flavor, and drinking water, tea or coffee for thirst as you enjoy. And how do we know this type of diet works? Well, this is just one of many studies um, that followed more than 200,000 men and women in the US from the Nurses Health Study and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study for more than 30 years. And they looked at the diet um, and they classified the diet into a healthy plant-based diet or a less healthy plant-based diet. And the less healthy was full of refined grains and sugary products and fried foods. And Compared to the omnivorous diet after this 30 year follow up, those eating mainly plants had an 8% reduction in heart disease. But if you were eating a healthy plant based diet like the power plate that I showed you, you could reduce your risk of heart disease by 25%. But there's a warning here. If you make it full of less healthy plant foods with refined sugars and grains, you can actually do just as badly as those on an omnivorous diet. So why does this work? Because a plant-based diet or a vegan diet takes care of every single risk factor that I've mentioned, you're more likely to be a healthy weight as a vegan, you're less likely, over 50% less likely to have um, type 2 diabetes, you're over 60% less likely to have a high blood pressure, and you are more likely to maintain a healthy cholesterol. Now, I just wanted to home in on some foods that are really good for maintaining your blood pressure, because if you're already doing the power plate and you want to just boost it up with some really good foods, here are six, some examples. All of these have had randomized studies showing you that they influence um, blood pressure. And we'll get salt out of the way first. Minimizing added salt is, is optimal because um, salt does elevate your blood pressure. Um, but leafy greens full of nitrates and also beetroot um, is a great source of nitrate that gets turns into nitrous oxide and maintains the health of that single layer of um, endothelial cells. Flax seeds have also been shown to reduce your blood pressure and so have whole grains. And then if we home in on lowering your cholesterol, the key items are reducing your saturated fat, but replacing it with healthy sources of fats like nuts or avocado um, and increasing fiber, which you naturally do by eating the whole plant foods um, and adding soya foods because soya protein has been shown to reduce LDL cholesterol. So what changes did my dad make? Well, I was really lucky that my friend and colleague, um, Rahini Bajekal, who you'll meet shortly, she's a nutritionist and lifestyle medicine professional, took my dad under her wing and really took him back to his roots of a healthy, whole food Indian diet, which is really full of all these foods that I've mentioned. Dal, um, steamed semolina cake, wholemeal javatis, um, it's tofu and aubergine curry, chickpea and potato curry. And you really can't go wrong with including oats in your diet, regardless of where you're from in the world, because it's full of healthy properties. 
So I'm really pleased to say that within six months, despite my misgivings, my dad was able to maintain um, his weight into the normal range, which he's done so to the present day. He's got his triglycerides back down and he's no longer pre-diabetic. And this is despite the fact that he only has um, two thirds of his pancreas. So a big thank you to Rahini. And as Dr. Barnard has mentioned, we shouldn't be so surprised because we've known since the 1990s that even if you have coronary heart disease, if you follow a healthy, low-fat plant-based diet and other healthy habits, you have the chance to arrest and even in some cases um, reverse the progression of atherosclerosis. In addition, when a vegan diet was put head to head with the American Heart Association diet in 100 people with coronary artery disease, the vegan diet won hands down for lowering inflammation, which is just as important as lowering your cholesterol is um, to preventing progression of heart disease. And there are an abundance of dietary myths that relate to coronary heart disease. So please don't fall for any of them. So white meat is no better than red meat. Animal protein is not superior to plant protein. Dietary cholesterol really does matter. Yes, sugar is a problem, but so is saturated fat. Eggs are not a so healthy source of protein. You can do so much better with beans and lentils and nuts. And dairy is not necessary for heart health. So these are my top tips. Eat a variety of healthy plant foods, limit salt. Learn to do some basic cooking. Use herbs and spices. Add a small portion, such as 30 grams a day of nuts and seeds, and add soya foods to your diet. And don't forget that it's not just diet that's important for heart health. You've got to take care of other lifestyle habits like physical activity, um, avoiding toxins, managing stress and, and sleep, and having healthy relationships. And this is the latest addition to our family, um, Belle, who traveled all the way from Cyprus from her, from her um, uh, rescue. Um, and you have to remember that dog ownership also reduces your risk of heart disease, whether the mechanism is more um, social connections, whether it's the gut microbiome, whether it's physical activity, it doesn't matter it's really good for you so all the references to my statements i've made can be found in our fact sheets plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com um, free downloads from for everybody um, and it's a really great day for me and my sister today because we launched our first book called eating plant-based which is available worldwide and again anything i've said will be referenced in this book that answers all your common questions thanks very much Thank you so much, Dr. Kassam. I've already seen some fantastic reviews of your book on Twitter, so I can't wait to read it myself. Um, yeah, lots of great comments. Um, people say your food looks delicious and they, they want to learn how to cook Indian food. I would um, definitely um, recommend that all those people have a look at our Indian programme. We have a One Healthy World programme spe uh, specifically designed for India, um, where you can learn how to cook some delicious curries and other traditional food, so uh, do sign up for that. Um, and yeah, great to see um, your, your dad's story, Shireen. Um, let's see, I've seen lots of patients very similar and uh, reminds me of the story from uh, the Game Changers movie as well, which we're going to be doing a screening of, uh, but James Wilkes manages to convince his father to, to go vegan and he has a, an, an amazing uh, turnaround of his heart disease. Um, lots of people commenting they wish they could uh, persuade their parents to, to go vegan um, so uh, if uh, uh, Shireen if you have any any tips on uh, how to uh, to make people make small changes um, that, that would be gratefully received I'm sure there's lots of that in your book as well but um, there's a lot of resistance to, to people changing their diets often what would you say is like one of the most simple things people can can do to start with yeah, so I think really simple things are just adding in maybe a portion of leafy greens or having rather than all the meals with meat, having one with beans or lentils or finding a meat substitute can sometimes be a good tra transition food. We're lucky enough to have microprotein, so corn in the UK, which is actually not so bad health wise. So um, you can find these little cheats to, to help you on your way and just get someone to support you. My dad had my mum and obviously Rahini as well, and it really makes a difference. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kassam. Okay, so now um, moving on, um, I have the great pleasure to introduce 
um, Karen Smith, who was with us last week. She is a registered dietitian at the Barnard Medical Center in Washington, DC. She specializes in supporting patients to follow plant-based diets. And today she is going to um, give us a bit more information on how to replace meat, dairy, and eggs in our diets. So over to you, Karen. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Colomar. It's great to be back and I'm loving all of the wonderful um, meals and dishes that people are sharing in the chat that you tried this week. Keep them coming, it's fantastic to see. So I think that Dr. Bernard and Dr. Kassam gave everyone um, wonderful reasons to set the animal products aside and to dive in this week to eating a plant-based diet. So how are we gonna do that? Well, <clears throat> making it meatless uh, really is simple and there are so many options um, to replace meat. So go ahead and share in the chat some of your favorite ideas. Um, Beans, lentils, seitan, tempeh, tofu, all of these are wonderful options for replacing meat um, in meals that you might already enjoy. I saw someone had a baked ziti that was vegan this week, right? So you can um, use any of these options and often um, they can be substituted for one another. So if a recipe calls for lentils and maybe you like chickpeas better, great, go for it. Um, there's also quite... Um, a lot of options when it comes to sauteing. If you're using uh, meat or seafood broth or stock, you can substitute with just plain water. Um, if you want to infuse some more flavor, miso is a wonderful fermented soy product that adds a lot of flavor to dishes. Um, there's vegetable broths and stocks, lots of varieties of vinegars that you might try as well. All right, and look at these amazing meals. All of these are available on PCRM's website. Um, some of my favorites, the tofu tacos. Um, and again, if you're not a huge fan of tofu or maybe you like lentils or black beans better, great, sub the tofu for one of those. That burger is made from chickpeas and oats. There's a really simple, delicious three ingredient chili. It's salsa, black beans, and corn. It is um, easy to put together um, and it's great to pack for lunches. If you're sending kids off to school, it keeps really well in a the thermos. And that is a delicious lentil and sweet potato uh, shepherd's pie. All right, so plenty of options for meat substitutes as well. Um, and just to keep in mind that some are really high in fat and oils and, and sodium as well. So depending on you know, your health goals and your tastes and what, what you want to achieve, um, it can be important to, you know, look at the labels and just do some comparison. So you can see this product here uh, has 12 grams of fat per serving uh, versus another product that has much less fat at two grams. And you can look at that ingredient label and often there's a section for allergens to check and see if there are any hidden dairy or egg products. So right there where it says contain soy, if there's milk or dairy, it will, it will say so. All right, so how about replacing dairy in our diets? There's not a shortage of options for replacing dairy milks. There are so many wonderful options available in virtually every grocery store at this point. Um, there are shelf stable varieties and they come in often smaller um, containers than what you might find in the refrigerated section. So sometimes it's fun to buy a few different kinds if you're just getting into this and, and to experiment and see what you might like best. Um, there's also a variety of, of yogurts, um, and vegan cheeses and coffee creamers. So again, depending on you know, your health goals, um, you might be paying more attention to added oils and, and sugars in these products. And certainly in the beginning, uh, many of these products can be great for helping you transition to a more plant-based or entirely plant-based diet. And who so has heard- Karen, oh, so ahead. I was just gonna ask, somebody in the comments said their husband has tried a few different plant milks and couldn't really find any that he liked. Um, so do you have any personal recommendation? What, what do you think is the, the tastiest 
or do you think it's it's just a personal decision and you should just try try lots of different ones yeah and and you know our tastes change too so if you're used to drinking dairy milk it definitely has you know a more distinctive and different taste than any of these non-dairy milks and sometimes just getting away from the dairy milk um, and allowing your taste buds some time to change and adapt to these new foods can really be helpful. So maybe not just going from dairy milk to a plant-based milk, but allowing yourself some time and coming back and doing some more tasting in, you know, two or three weeks. Um, often people say, you know, by then their tastes have changed and those non-dairy milks taste, taste different because they've set aside the dairy milk and no longer have that you know, that taste that, that they're looking for. Mm. They're kind of more open yeah. to a different, a different option. Yeah, definitely. You're completely right. Someone in the comments has just said their taste buds changed a lot when they went vegan. And I found the same. Uh, personally, I find my favorite milk in tea is oat milk, but um, everyone's got their own preferences. So yeah, for sure. Nice and creamy, the oat milk. Um, great in those hot beverages. So yeah, nutritional yeast is a really wonderful, um, cheesy food that you can just sprinkle on top of a variety of dishes. And it also can be an ingredient in um, do-it-yourself vegan cheeses. So things that you can make at home without, you know, adding in the oils or, or as much salt um, as you might find in those commercial vegan cheeses. And I personally find them way, way more tasty as well. So, um, you know, over the weekend, I made a dish with blending some, some cashews and nutritional yeast and spices uh, and just a little bit of, of water for a really creamy, um, vegan cheese sauce, delicious. And um, you can do the same by using white beans or even cooked potatoes and carrots. So some other delicious cheese substitutes, hummus, who would have thought, right? But it melts, it's nice and creamy. So instead of making a grilled cheese or a cheese quesadilla, try swapping the cheese with hummus. It's absolutely delicious. Or spreading hummus on a tortilla or some uh, a pizza crust instead of cheese and it melts and it's just a wonderful and much healthier uh, option. You're getting you know, fiber and all the wonderful nutrients packed in those beans. Um, there's also great recipes out there for a tofu ricotta. So again, like getting the benefits of including that soy in your diet um, instead of all the saturated fat and sodium and cheese. Uh, butternut squash is also another great option, nice and creamy when it's blended. And again, all of these pictures are from recipes found on the PCRM website. So there's, there's the link right there. And I know Resendo has been sharing it quite a bit in the chat. Um, eggs, I think are so, so simple to replace. There's so many options out there, especially when it comes to replacing them in, you know, your cooking and baking. Um, that tofu scramble is um, just a really yummy, uh, delicious, very versatile uh, way to replace scrambled eggs by adding in, you know, whatever variety of veggies you like, spices, maybe throw in some black beans. Um, Add in some nutritional yeast if you want a little bit of that cheesy flavor. That middle picture um, are chickpea frittatas. So chickpea flour and adding a little bit of uh, black salt, which gives like an eggy uh, flavor can, can be a great substitute and really great. You can freeze them and just pull them out of the freezer for a quick snack or, or to pack um, for meals on the go. And there's also some products out there that you see, like again, some some products already made to, to replace eggs, whether you're gonna scramble it up or um, use it in baking. And tons of substitutes for eggs when you bake, um, much healthier things like pumpkin or mashed banana or applesauce um, or a variety of uh, non-dairy yogurts would, would work as well. Ground flax seeds mixed with a little water can be a great egg substitute. So um, the Physicians Committee has an excellent ingredient substitution chart that's available to you. Um, so not only for eggs, but also for those meat and, and dairy and even oil and butter substitutes as well. So yeah, I hope everyone will try some of these things out this week and come back and let us know how it went. 
yeah thank you so much yeah we've um, lots of comments about people's favorite uh, things to replace meat dairy and eggs um uh, bulgur wheat someone uses to replace beef which um i've never I've not tried but that sounds really good um with uh, scrambled tofu and chickpea omelette lots of people love nutritional yeast um it's really delicious i would just um make sure if you're new to nutritional yeast you make sure you're getting uh, you're not getting the brewer's yeast or baker's yeast that because that's quite different um for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah. um and with the plant milks lots of different um preferences so i think it really is a matter of your own taste buds and and trying different things um so great any um Karen, what would you say is one of your your favorite recipes from the uh the pcrm websites is there anything that you particularly love so i love that three ingredient chili it's been a hit in my family for years now because it's so simple and we can put it on top of potatoes um or sometimes i even put it on top of leafy greens and add in even more veggies i love you know just how simple and tasty it is for sure. That's probably my all time favorite. Yeah, great choice. I love chili for the same reason. It's so easy and, uh, but yeah, really tasty and health healthy. It's, it's a perfect meal. Um, thank you so much, Karen. Really my appreciate pleasure. your time. Okay, so now moving on to our uh, expert panel discussion. I'm really excited to introduce um, four fantastic international guests. Uh, we, uh, I'll start with introducing uh, Nicola Kogoro, aka Chef Kola. She's a Zimbabwean chef who runs African Vegan on a Budget and has written a book by the same name. She recently founded Chef Kola's African Inspired Kitchens. Hello. Um, a community developed project that develops plant based kitchens in Zimbabwe. And she is the executive uh, chef for the International Anti Poaching Foundation. Thank you, Nicola. And uh, do you prefer Nicola or Chef Cola either? Uh, Chef Cola, Nicola, whichever one is okay. Okay, great. Thank okay. you. And then next up is uh, Willie Jonas. He is a passionate health advocate and plant-based promoter who is studying medicine in Indonesia. Willie spent time interning with us at the Physicians Committee and was featured in our 2021 International Conference on Nutrition in Medicine. So thank you very much and welcome, Willie. Hey, thank you, Josh. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, and then we have Luke Tan. He is a coach, educator, author, athlete, bodybuilder, and joins us from Singapore, where it's incredibly early in the morning. Um, so thank you so much. Where he lives with his wife and two children. He is the co-founder of Plant Fit Summit, a yearly online event where health professionals, athletes, uh, and inspirational people come together to advocate a thriving, fit, plant-based lifestyle. So thank you so much, Luke. Um, and then uh, last but not least, we have um, Rahini Bajakal, uh, who is a friend from the UK. She is a nutritionist, board certified lifestyle medicine professional and head of communications and marketing at Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. In her spare time, she volunteers as a cookery teacher at the plant-based community cookery school made in Hackney, and she is the co-author of Living PCOS Free. So thank you so much, uh, Rahini. Great to thank see you. Me. Great to see Thanks you. And, uh, and Dr. Barnard, I think, will be joining us again shortly as well. Um, there you are. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnard. So um, thank you again all so much for joining us, um, particularly uh, Willie and Luke and uh, Nicola, where uh, Thank you. you're, you're, you're joining from uh, uh, such different time zones. Um, so yeah, um, I understand, we'll start with you, Willie. I understand you've got some, some great recipes uh, you would like to share with us. Yes, yeah. so um, I'm from Indonesia, and so I would love to share some Indonesian plant-based recipes because we are very plant-centric diet that we have in Indonesia. So it's really easy to become plant-based. And for those of you who are wanting to try in, an international uh, recipes, this is something that we've made at Bandung Adventist Hospital. It's called Manado Porridge. It's something, uh, it, it's a recipe from a specific region in Indonesia. 
And so it's very easy. Uh, this is all the ingredients. I, uh, I bet you can get all these uh, ingredients wherever you are. Um, probably watercress is one of the unique uh, vegetable that you can, um, maybe it's hard to find in, in certain area, but you can uh, switch, uh, switch it with kale or, or any other vegetable. And uh, we've, I've made, uh, uh, I've given the link uh, for you to follow here uh, to see how we make it. And then the next one is gulai tahu. This is how cer a certain um, way to, to, to make your tofu taste even better. Uh, this is very related to Indonesian culture. And then this is all the ingredients. Uh, probably some of the unique ingredients is galangal. I'm not sure, Josh, have you tried to cook with galangal? No, I've um, never heard is, of it. We, we use a lot of spices here in Indonesia, for example, candle nut. This is uh, very unique to Indonesian cooking as well. A galangal, candle, candle nut, but probably most of you know, already know like coriander, cumin, pepper, and other ingredients. So I, I challenge you to try these Indonesian recipes. Thank you so much. I think that that's given a lot of people inspiration. People are very excited about that in the chat. This looks very yummy. Um, uh, how about you, Nicola? Do you have any um, particular favorite recipes you think would be good for, for people starting out uh, on their vegan journey? I work a lot in rural communities where they don't have access to electricity and water. And a lot of people in those communities are actually in denial that they're on vegan diets, but then they actually are because of um, the issues I just raised. So we, we use a lot of soy, um, soy chunks, which they like to call nyama, which literally means meat because of the meaty texture. So most of the recipes that I use um, are, have to do with soy chunks and things like legumes and lentils and a lot of leafy greens, um, mainly because of the people who I'm feeding, they're, they're rangers. So they have to have as much, um, food that has a lot of weight and value and gives them energy to do their job so yeah fantastic and i, I hear it goes down extremely well what's yeah, what's the, the the trick with the um the tofu and the soya pieces because um it it really can be very different depending how how you cook it mm. um, found that a, is it using particular spices or anything yeah we, for we use a lot of indigenous um, vegetables that are grown um, in our area so we'll make a lot of gravies a lot of stews using indigenous vegetables that are grown so that's what makes it different fantastic um okay and luke uh, how about you um uh, any particular favorite recipes and we have well, a, a few comments of people wanting um recipes that are good for for children and i know you've got children is there anything that uh, is particularly uh, appealing to, to children? Um, yeah, I think for me, really, it's just easy. easy as for, for my, my child is six, turning five, actually. And uh, what she actually loves is grain bowls. And the whole family loves grain bowls. And I think the beautiful thing about grain bowls is that you have infinite combinations. So you can use local vegetables. Um, and of course, tofu or tempeh, where Willie, uh, Willie is from. Uh, tempeh is from Indonesia. So, so really having a protein source and different vegetables. And my daughter loves broccoli. But I think the key to tie it all in is the sauce. So whatever sauce that you can make, we make a satay sauce. Sometimes we make a sesame base, a tahini based sauce. So just really having that grain bowl allows for the whole family to just kind of pick and choose what they want, you know, to have, you know, your vegetables on one side. So essentially you have all these dishes there and if Sienna doesn't like, she hates capsicum. So she doesn't pick the capsicum uh, and she might put the corn in. And I think that's a beautiful way, um, an easy way for everyone to kind of get nutrient diversity because nutrient diversity is the color, you know, nutrient diversity is access through the color of foods. So the more color you have on your plate, um, the more nutrients you get. So I think the first thing to look for me, at least for my daughter, is the color of her plate. And the next thing for me is what I love and what she used to love is, um, once again, grain-based uh, oatmeal. So I, I'm going to share my screen just briefly, and I'll just show you what this grain bowl kind of looks like. Uh, well, not oatmeal bowl. This has been literally has been my breakfast for 
years now. I, I, I'm a Taurus, so I'm quite stubborn. So I've been sticking to the same thing for the past few years. And it's literally just a bowl of oatmeal with some dates, um, pumpkin seeds, uh, berries, uh, and an apple. And I top it up with some, maybe some soy milk, some oil, uh, oat milk, oh, and drizzled with some ape, uh, maple syrup. And this has been my staple for many years. And because I train quite often, for me, um, this bowl itself is about 12 to 1300 calories. Um, in there, particularly from the nuts and seeds. So, so I think it's it's important for me to consume sufficient calories for my um, for my activity level. So I would say that really grain bowls, uh, having a, and an oatmeal, uh, oatmeal are, are key for me. But beyond that, um, I think the the other thing that I, I love doing is the other hack, if you want to call it, that that I introduce uh, I incorporate is what I'm based in South Southeast, Southeast Asia in Singapore. So there's all sorts of different Southeast Asian foods. Uh, for example, one of these things, uh, one of the, the dishes is called char kway teow, which is fried uh, fried uh, uh, kind of kway teow, like rice noodles and Hokkien noodles. But the thing is, I do it plant based and healthier. So I just put plant based in front of any recipe that I love. And there's bound to be a recipe in there. And I, I don't use refined oils. So I, I use a nonstick pan. Uh, I use spray oils and basically create a healthier version of what would normally be a very highly calorie dense um, calorie dense meal. So really just adding that word plant-based or vegan to any local, re any recipe that you love you will find something and then based on whatever ingredients there are, you can kind of dial down the oil, dial down, dial, dial, dial down the uh, sugar and, and things like that. Yeah, people often will say, you know, but what do you eat as a vegan? And uh, as, as you've said, and as Karen has said, you can make vegan versions of, of anything. Um, and Rah Rahini, you, I know that you're um, uh, a chef at uh, the, the community school made in Hackney. Which is a very multicultural area. What um, what recipes would you say go down the the best there? Well, I always like taking inspiration from cultures that have been predominantly plant based for centuries, really, because that's really where the flavors shine, and they really know how to celebrate plants. So, if you feel sort of stuck and you kind of go, "Where do I start?" Where do, you know you're so used to looking at at a meal as meat and two veg then it's really great to look to these cultures to take inspiration for how meals, how um, how plants can be the center of the meal. So um, my family is actually from South India. So I actually teach oil-free Indian cooking at Maiden Hackney and offer lots of nutrition tips. And that really helped me manage my polycystic ovary syndrome as well. When I moved to India in my mid twenties, I found that returning back to my cultural diet of eating whole plant foods, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, and of course, lots of beans, especially lentils in the form of dal in India really helped. So I love cultures that have lentils and really use a lot of beans. So, um, and India, there's so many different ways that you can include beans and lentils in Indian dishes. And my personal favorite, which comes from um, the part of India I'm from, South India, is dosa, which is like a savory pancake and it's fermented and it's absolutely delicious. Traditionally, you would have it with white rice, but I sub in brown rice and I even add different types of lentils in. So you can make it even without rice and do five different types of dals like mung dal and split pigeon peas and different things and it's fermented so it's absolutely brilliant for your gut microbiome and it has a really complex flavor and this exists in other cultures and um, other cuisines as well so in ethiopian cuisine you get a wonderful fermented sour bread called um, injera, which is made of teff flour, which is really wonderful, high in protein and other micronutrients like iron and calcium. So if you sort of think of lentils as being kind of bland and, and, and not very appetizing, then definitely look to these cultures for some new and exciting recipes. Sounds fantastic. And where are the best places for people to get these, these ingredients? Because I'm sure a lot of people haven't, haven't heard of lots of these things. Are they yeah, easy to find? It might sound like a foreign language, but all you need is brown rice and you can use any type of lentils. So one of the best places to shop is definitely if you've got um, a large supermarket, then the world food aisle is a good place that you can find some of these ingredients. But 
any um, kind of different world food stores, so Indian stores, Pakistani stores, you can get all of these things like lentils really at really affordable prices and you'll get a huge variety there as well. And often zero waste stores, sometimes you can take your own containers and get lots of different types of lentils and things there. And if you're cooking lentils from scratch, um, they might take maybe 10 minutes longer, but lentils cook pretty quickly and mm. you'll be saving a lot of money this way as well. And they can often be lower in sodium as well. Yeah, they're so cheap. Thank you. Dr. Barnard, um, do you have a particular uh, international cuisine that's your favourite? Um, you know, I, I have to say I'm very much in line with Ro what Rohini has been mentioning. Um, I grew up in North Dakota. And so meat was always at the center of the plate. And if you were going vegan or vegetarian, meat wasn't there and people might think, well, it's kind of missing. But if we thought about really familiar international cuisine, there are some plates where you really didn't expect the meat. So nobody really missed it. So for us, that often meant say, just an Italian plate. If you had a big plate of spaghetti with, with tomato sauce, nobody was really thinking, where's a big hunk of meat in the middle of it? Um, uh, or if you wanted to have some vegan meatballs, they're everywhere and pretty easy to make too, but you didn't even have to have that. Or you could make a lasagna and you can replace the cheese that's in lasagna with tofu or other, other ways of replacing it. There are at least a thousand vegan lasagna recipes online and they will seduce a meat eater into thinking they're great. Same thing with mac and cheese. So the reason I'm mentioning these is they're a little bit different from what I grew up with but they're hearty and healthy and tasty when they're in vegan versions. And everybody thinks they're great, including all the eight-year-old neighborhood kids who come to your house for a birthday. Nobody's gonna complain and say it was a vegan birthday. They're gonna say it was great. Um, aside from Italian, um, Latin American cuisine brings us bean burritos, veggie tacos that everybody absolutely enjoys, especially if you throw some jalapenos in them to give them a little zip. Um, and Chinese food, rice, vegetables, tofu. Tofu is the one thing that everybody is terrified of until they taste it made the right way. And then they get addicted to it and they want to have it forever. And let me tip my hat once again to Indonesia because when people learn how to make tempeh the right way, and I'm just an idiot, I gotta tell you. I get tempeh. Willie, I hope I don't drive you crazy with what I'm gonna say. I, in the morning, I just slice up temp some tempeh, marinate it in some soy sauce for about like three seconds, and then it throws in the pan, cook it on both sides, and it comes up crispy and great. And for me, that's sort of like bacon done vegan style. Um, anyway, is that okay, Willie? Yes, definitely. You know what's funny? That's actually my go-to food as well. I, I do exactly the same what you do because that's super easy, super fast, and it tastes really good. Yeah, exactly. And the more I burn it, the more it tastes like the bacon my mother used to feed me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bacon substitute. Yeah, ex ex exactly. And, and uh, you can marinate it in different ways. And you can do the same with tofu if you want. You just take a tofu slab, throw it in the you know, if it's freely firm tofu, throw it in your pan and everyone's afraid of it until, wait a minute, how did you do that? And then they discover they love it. Um, Nicola, there's uh, lots of love for your book here in the chat, African Vegan on a Budget. So highly recommend that people check that out. Um, uh, what, what would you say is um, the, the recipe that really um, surprises people the most? Um, that, that people think they're not going to like and actually, um, you know, they're, they're blown away? Because I know that happens a lot. And that's a difficult question because I love all my recipes. And <laughs> but I think my take on, um, I did a take on vegan nachos, which is more like Mexican, but then I put a lot of African in ingredients and indigenous um, um, ingredients in it. So I kind of Africanized vegan nachos. I think that's the one that I'm excited about. Fantastic. And because um, you, you, you're a chef for um, the International Anti-Poaching Federation, and that's yes. um, full of very active people on their feet, running around all day. So, you mm -hmm. know, they, they need lots of, of energy. And that's one yes. of the misconceptions people get sometimes as well, um, that, that, you know, without meat, how are they going to have the energy? And that's something probably Luke can, can help us with as well. But um, yeah, Nicola, what do, you, um, what do you think about giving people enough, enough calories? Oof, 
Well, <laughs> that's a good question because I feed um, rangers. So they're the world's only armed female rangers and they are about 500, 600 in the units and getting enough calories for them to do their jobs to go into the bush for extended periods of time. Usually they'll go from three o'clock in the morning up until towards the end of the day or they can actually stay three weeks in the bush. So getting enough calories is, we eat a lot of starch. There's something called pop. Um, it's mini meal actually that's um, lightly cooked. And we add that with cooked beans, some peanut stew um, dishes also. So just using ingredients, a lot of indigenous ingredients that are plant-based that they enjoy and like to eat. Um, that's how we make sure that they get their calories because they don't like taking supplements um, things like B12 vitamins because they didn't grow up um, with that um, culture of taking um, vitamins. So everything has to be natural. Okay, and Luke, um, how about you? What, uh, what do you think is the, the best refueling uh, food after a, a, a long workout? A long workout, I think really, um, I would say depending on when it is, like immediately after a workout, I would say definitely a carb-based uh, like a you know like a four to one ratio I would say meaning more like a, a juice or something that is high in sugar at least for me when I train hard because glycogen stores need to be re replenished but I would say one to two hours later I would say like uh, any 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 plant based meal that would put an emphasis on legume sources and I think I just want to kind of pick up on what you said about um, eating sufficient calories which is key which is why I showed my bowl earlier I think for me and and I. And what I found with clients that I've worked with was, you know, when you move to a plant-based diet, many people feel lethargic and they blame the iron, they blame the B12, they blame the protein. But a lot of times it's insufficient calories that that um, uh, that people fall short of. And um, looking at the calorie density scale, like uh, one to 600 calories, normally like the starches, as Chef Cola mentioned, starches and legume sources are a little bit higher in the calorie density scale. And also uh, things like nuts and seeds will be will be great. So I think getting more of these, and of course, uh, fruits, a lot of fruits, uh, I'm based in Singapore, so tropical fruits as well, all of that with the bulk of your calories, and of course, uh, 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 unlimited amount of vegetables as well. So I think all of that will get sufficient calories. And so to answer your question, I would say like, uh, like, uh, like I would say even coconut juice post-workout uh, and then subsequently, um, you know, a, a, a bigger plant-based meal. It could be bean burritos. It could be a whatever plant-based meal that I've cooked after. And uh, what I love as well is smoothies. Uh, I really, really love smoothies um, because it, I can jam a lot of nutrients in in one in, in in a Vitamix, I can put lots of lots of spinach, um, carrots, bananas, and sprinkle some chia seeds in there, and maybe add a super greens powder. And for me, it's all about jamming as much nutrients as I can in each calorie. So adding, really adding a lot of bang for buck because all these nutrients and antioxidants help with recovery, help with uh, muscle building, and help with your immune system as well. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to draw things to a close. Uh, we've run out of time, but really appreciate your time, especially everyone that's got up so early to, to give us all your inspiration. I think you've, you've really helped people, uh, you know, give, give them some great ideas. Um, so thank you again. Um, so um, thank you very much, everyone around the world who's joined us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, we hope this has been helpful. And we really hope that you will be able to join us again uh, next week. We'll be joined again um, by Karen Smith and re uh, registered diet dietitian Jennifer Paul to discuss, discuss protein, calcium, B12 and other important nutrients and how to eat healthily in restaurants. We'll also be joined by Dr. Hannah Kaliova, who will be telling us about foods to boost your metabolism. And for our expert panel discussion, uh, Willie Jonas will be joining us again, we're delighted to say, and um, we'll also be joined by Dr. Leila Dagan from the UK and Chef Bola Adeyanyu from Nigeria to dis uh, discuss international dining. So thank you so much again. I just would like to um, tell you again uh, about our um, uh, organisational um, partners who um, 
help to get the word out about this program. So please do check out their resources. Um, so that's Plant Based Health Professionals UK, uh, which Dr. Shireen Kassam and Rahimi Bajakal have joined us from today. Um, Switch have some fantastic recipes. Their website is uh, thebigswitch.com. Um, the International Vegetarian Union, the Black Veg Society and Freedom from Diabetes. So we really um, are grateful for your support. And again, we wish you an extremely happy and healthy week. Uh, this will be available online tomorrow. So get your friends and family to watch and we will see you again soon. Thank you so much. Take care.